if you were a nut job. And I was rocking a James Dean white tee. <laughs> Things change. So as we came out of the 70s and went into the 80s, you know, we had great pricing in the 70s. Tax laws in the 80s favored investment. There were new strains of reds that colored in the Columbia Basin really well. And there was a lot of land out there available. And we also had some high quality workers came in in, in, a, in droves from Mexico. Then we got the 80s. We had a major freeze in 85. There was a lot of hail events in that period. We had the Allard crisis to wind it all out. We had overproduction of Red Delicious as a result of all the nutty plantings in the early 80s. Um, and fierce price competition, tough on a lot of smaller guys. Few people were hearing about some profits from a variety called Gala though. Still nut jobs, but. So as we went into the 90s, growers were looking for solutions. Galas, Fuji's, Braeburn seemed like a decent alternative when you weren't making any money at all on reds. Um, but everybody was looking to avoid price competition. Anything you could do to get out of that bloodbath. We had more productive rootstocks, higher density plantings were coming in, people like Grady Hall were planting high density and sharing the news. And of course, at the end of that period, we saw the first of the clubs. People uh, liked and they liked what they thought they were getting from New Zealand and, and wanted to sign up for a steady diet. Here's the per box prices in the 90s. I apologize for the small type. I never have figured out how to get that to expand on PowerPoint. Not very good. 1990, look at those numbers for Fuji in blue. 40, 45 bucks. 1990. Red's down there sucking along at 10 or 11. There's the effect with today's, with inflation to today's time, right? So really the price was in today's dollars, 80 bucks, 90 bucks. That's enough to wind you up. Plant a few trees, huh? <laughs> kind of like what's happened with Cosmic. Some really high numbers on the front side. Wound up a lot of folks. So new varieties look like the answer, right? They're easy to get. Heck, Grady had me cutting wood for people almost full time. They're inexpensive, we did it for free. There were ready export markets. The island of Taiwan was smuggling Fujis from Japan. And they were willing to buy for almost any price up to a certain point. You saw where that all fell off on that graph. We filled that market. And all these varieties, what we found out is we got to buy the learning curve. Just like we're buying it with Cosmic, there's nothing different. I mean, we're gonna figure it out. We have to. Some of us figure it out a little better than others, though. During that period, the Washington Breeding Program was born. And I was on the commission at the time. Uh, 1995, a couple of the commissioners became very concerned that we wouldn't have access to varieties from around the world unless we had our own breeding program. We worked with Barrett and the university to create the breeding program. And the research commission agrees to fund the operating expenses and WSU provides the researcher and the location. Breeding program became in 1996, the single biggest project of the research commission. We invested over 25 years, $5.5 million. Such a change. So here's my deal. Just the first part. You give me 5.5 million, I'll use my existing labor and facilities, and uh, I'll try to create some products you might like. We'll decide on the terms, though, to use those products after I develop them. And we'll configure the testing and your access to it around my need to protect my patent rights. <laughs> So here's, we'll, we'll go over the deal later, we'll think about it. The first club, so Enza takes the lead, they've got a, a, a deal. I just so happened to be able to see a few agreements over the years based on where it worked. Um, they're all pretty much the same. The owner of the variety has all the control. That's the bottom line. You have no control. You make no decisions, they will tell you. 
They will work with you, apparently, they all do, WSU has, ANZA did. It's in their interest to work with you, but legally you have no control. So I, I went to a responsible, educated person, got some quotes. <laughs> <laughs> find anybody else. I couldn't find a good poet to quote. So, my opinion, Law 38 is not a low-cost, easy-to-farm replacement for Red Delicious. That was what we were told it was going to be. In the truth, it's way more similar to, to Fuji. And I made a pretty good career out of Fuji and a good living. So, I do wonder if I'd gone with Gala more strongly, if it had been my life had been easier. I think it would have. So here's the similarities and the differences that I see between these two varieties. They both are basically dominant. The bottom wants to grow, the top doesn't. Strong growth. They're both tip bearers. They're both very alternate bearing in my opinion, and I think Stefano bears that out. Fuji is easy to overset. You wave a bee and some pollen near a Fuji tree and every single bloom wants to set. You do the same to a Wa 38, it might set, it might not. Yes, they're working on it, I understand that. They're both really nitrogen sensitive. We heard early on that, you know, don't give it too much in, and now we're, you know, now we're hearing, you know, you're not giving it enough in. I, it's, it's confusing like a lot of new varieties. They both have big apples. Now, is that an advantage? Is that a disadvantage? 10 years ago, I'd swear up and down big apples were an advantage, but you try to ship a big apple now, everybody wants a bag. Um, Fuji doesn't store real well. I'm always nervous when I've got Fujis in a, bin, in a room. They get scald, they can go IB if you got much water core. Wa 38's a bullet. We've dropped them outside in common storages and left them right by a door for a year. They don't, you can eat them. <laughs> They're in good shape. The apple is amazing with the way it stores. Strong. I've never seen scald on it. Maybe somebody has. I haven't seen IB in it. Maybe somebody has. It's, it's a tough apple for storage, as long as it doesn't get punctured and rot. And of course, it wasn't supposed to be sunburned. It was bred for our environment. It sunburns. Is it as bad as Honeycrisp? Maybe not but it does burn, and when it blows up, it blows up bad. It splits the whole side. So here's my assumptions on Wa 38, what's gonna happen with it. I think it's like a Fuji. So what do we get on Fujis? Well, pretty good Fuji grower, average 55 bins probably. You know, you got 70 bin on here, and a 40 bin off here, or something like that. It's pretty common, I think most people agree. That's the increase in production, I've assumed. You know, based on Garrett's numbers, I think he's got the front of the elephant. Um, you know, he's, he's producing more more quickly. But this is kind of what I think an average guy would do. So that's the maximum production at 55 bins an acre. We're going from nothing to 16 million at 55 bins an acre. So just for laughs, I went back and took 90 to to 2005, basically, on Fuji's, and put it on a graph next to the predicted production of Wa 38 over that same period, 15 years, one to 15. And, you know, really, it's not that different. I mean, you're going up a few million more, but that graph is with no more tree plantings. Zero, not one more tree in the ground after this last year. Oh, there it is at a 65 average. If everybody's Garrett over here, thought I'd hope not. <laughs> 18 million boxes. Is that, is that concerning? Well, the Fuji, there's a huge export component in those Fujis. That's where a lot of them went. It sounds like the university's going to fill all those export markets and produce them in those countries. So I don't, I don't know whether we have an opportunity. Here's the rest of my deal. I'm going to need a, a dollar royalty. You're going to agree to never propagate my tree. You're going to agree that any sport you find is mine. I'll tell you what you can do with it when you can pick it, how you can handle it. You give me 4.75% of, of your gross, 
And that includes your packing charges, by the way. And you'll do that forever. Well, you don't have to pay me under 20 bucks. I can sell it to anybody I want, anytime I want. Um, I'll give you some verbal promises, but they aren't in the contract. Uh, then I won't tell you, I won't promise you anything. The contract doesn't guarantee a thing. The, the tree's a tree, it's your problem. So here's how I see the relative investment in this, in this apple. You've spent $5.484 million through the Treefruit Research Commission to develop this as an angel investor. You've paid $16 million in tree royalties, approximately. You spent 50 grand an acre for a total of $572 million for the acres you planted. So the growers of Washington today have $594 million sunk in this variety. I understand the university has a commitment, but it's not that. So when I take the costs, and I take the, if you look at the packs, 18, you look at the bins per acre, pick your line, packs boxes per acre at 18 packs, you take your costs of 13,816 divided into that, where's your break even? Well, huh, at 50 bins, about 28 bucks. So you need to get 28. We're at 40, a little over 40 now. So it's fallen from 80 to 40 something. And do the math based on predictions. You can look there. If you're Garrett, life's not bad. He's over here at, you know, 22 bucks. I can fight my way through with that. Here's what concerns me. The hope before with these varieties was that they were gonna move the needle. They were gonna get people eating more apples. They haven't done that. This hasn't happened. We've induced dozens of varieties and haven't moved domestic consumption an inch. So I throw you a question. Who owns Envy? First of the club varieties. Came out from New Zealand Heart Research. We all know that they had a socialist system that got converted to a capitalist system and it was painful. Apple and Pear Marketing Board used to get to sell all the apples out of New Zealand that were exported. The New Zealand growers ended up owning the variety, basically, through Enzyme. Through a tricky kind of buyout deal I don't still understand. Guinness Pete, a private company, ended up owning it. Guinness Pete also owned a bunch of turners and growers, and I don't understand the machinations here, but eventually turners and growers ended up with the rights to the variety. And then a German company called Bewa bought them. Now you have a German company <laughs> that owns the New Zealand variety. Seems, seems a little complicated. And they can sell it to anybody they want. So what happened? The ends of growers in the U.S. joined because they thought they were going to avoid competition. They got Pacific Rose as their first choice, and it was a loser, I think. Personal opinion. No offense to anybody still growing it. Second variety was Jazz. Some guys liked it. Some guys didn't. Third variety was Envy. Huge winner, I think. It's a really good apple. Top three in my mind. 2021, there was rumors out on the street, they haven't come to me personally, but I understand I can buy the opportunity to grow Envy. Now, if I was that guy that put in the Pacific Rose, I'd be unhappy. Who owns WA38? Well, WSU does. But as we discussed before, they can do any darn thing they want with it. What prevents them to sell it for selling it to an investment group? Nothing that I can find. This is political, personal opinion, and I will label it as such. We are trading apples that we spent ten thousand an acre to plant for fifty thousand dollar an acre apples. 
In the past, we competed against each other using our farming skills with the same varieties. This variety gold brush that we're on means we get to uh, still compete against each other, and we're going to do it with varieties that we get to pay a royalty on and pull that load. And that load is a lot like what we had for a net margin over time. If you think you make more than 10% over the whole course of your career, I don't know, maybe you do if you're really good. So we've committed to pay royalties in future years while agreeing to let someone else control a good share of the decisions that affect our profitability after we have made a huge investment in the plant. So I've come up with some fantasy solutions. Karen said I had to have a solution, not just a problem. So I do. I think the royalty rates for WA38 are not fair considering our investment, considering what the product is compared to what we thought we'd get. I think they should consider changing that relationship. I don't think there should be another WA38 planted until we figure out how we're going to sell the ones that are in the crown. I think the Tree Fruit Research Commission needs to take a different look at projects, especially if they are going to be intended to produce a product. And they should negotiate a little more aggressively. I think they should look at the return on investment from the work that they do. I don't think that we've ever really looked back and said, oh, we funded this and the industry got that. And last but not least, you just stop signing these agreements that are completely one-sided. Everybody signs them and then everybody has to sign them. And yes, I signed one. That's my entire vision from the rear end of the elephant. <laughs> Okay, so we only have one question. So, Epic. did you color pick? <laughs> did you color pick, Gary? Come on. No color pick. No color picking. Not this year. Okay. Okay. So um, that is it. There are no questions. Anyone want to stand up and ask a question? Like in live time, real time. I know lunch, okay. Um, so listen, well, thank you. Um, I think it is because it's lunchtime, not because they don't have questions, but everyone knows how to get a hold of the Silver Apple Award, Dave Gleason, the Good Fruit Grower of the Year, Mike Robinson, and the mega producer in Tennessee. <laughs> thank you everybody, sorry about the technical.